students here may know who I am, but for those who are watching the broadcast, I'm Steve Knapp, President of George Washington University, and it's really a pleasure to welcome you to today's first class in a series entitled Reflections on the Federal Reserve and its Place in Today's Economy, featuring the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Dr. Ben Bernanke. I'm pleased to acknowledge that we have with us uh, two of the university's trustees, Nelson Carbonell and Mark Schaefman, and also a number of faculty members are here in the audience, and some of them will be teaching later in the series. Today is the first university lecture series delivered by a sitting chairman of the Federal Reserve. I think it does provide an extraordinary opportunity for the students who are here in the classroom, but also for those watching online. They have an opportunity to gain insight into the nation's central banking system and a wide range of issues that affect this country and the world. I do want to say that there are microphones available for the students and certainly encourage you when the chairman's lecture is uh, over to uh, avail yourself of those and we hope there will be a lively exchange of uh, questions and answers at the end of the lecture. It's now a distinct honor to introduce the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, Dr. Ben Bernanke. Dr. Bernanke took office in 2006 and is now serving his second term as chairman. He also serves as chairman of the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee. Before his appointment as chairman, Dr. Bernanke was involved with the Federal Reserve in several roles as a member of the Board of Governors, as a visiting scholar, and as a member of the Academic Advisory Panel at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He also served as Chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from June 2005 to January 2006. Now, Chairman Bernanke is no stranger to academia. He's been a faculty member at Princeton, Stanford, and New York University, as well as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's held a Guggenheim and a Sloan Fellowship and is a fellow of the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Chairman Bernanke received a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard University and a PhD from MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Dr. Ben Bernanke. Thank you very much, President Knapp. Um, gee, this is great. Um, this is what I used to do before I got in this line of work. Uh, for 23 years, and I've, I've uh, always enjoyed uh, engaging with college students, so thank you for being here, and I hope we do have a good conversation. Um, let me particularly thank uh, President Knapp and uh, Professor Fort and George Washington University. As everybody here knows, um, these lectures are part of a real course, and uh, after I get off the scene, um, there will be other professors talking about other aspects of the Fed, and you'll hear different points of view, which is great. And uh, you'll have to do some papers and all kinds of things, and I'm going to read a few of the papers. So I look forward to, uh, to doing that. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, talking from, uh, from slides. What I want to talk about in these four lectures is uh, the Federal Reserve and the financial crisis. <coughs> My thinking about this is very much conditioned by my experience as an economic historian. I think when you talk about the issues that just occurred in the last few years, it makes the most sense um, to think about it in the broader context of central banking as it's taken place over the centuries. So uh, even though we're going to be focusing a, a good bit of the lectures, particularly next week, on the financial crisis and how the Fed responded, I think we need to go back and look at the broader context. So. Um, as we talk about the uh, Fed, we'll be talking about uh, the origin and mission of central banks in general. And we're looking at uh, previous financial crises, most notably the Great Depression, and see how that informed uh, the Fed's actions and decisions in the recent crisis. So let me just give you a roadmap of the four lectures. Uh, uh, today, lecture one, um, we won't touch on the current crisis at all. Instead, we'll talk about what central banks are, what they do. Um, how central banking uh, got started in the United States, and we'll do some history. We'll talk about how the Fed engaged with its first great challenge, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. The second lecture on Thursday, we'll take up the history, we'll review developments in central banking and with the Federal Reserve after World War II, talking about uh, the conquest of inflation, the Great Moderation, and other developments that occurred after World War II. But we'll spend a good bit of time lecture two, in Lecture 2 talking about the build-up to the crisis and some of the factors that led uh, to the crisis uh, of 2008-2009. Then next week, we'll get into the more recent uh, events. Uh, in Lecture 3, we'll talk about the intense phase of the financial crisis, 
um, its causes, its implications, and particularly uh, the response to the crisis by the Federal Reserve and by other policymakers. And then in the final lecture, lecture four, uh, we'll look at the aftermath. We'll talk about uh, the recession that followed the crisis, uh, the policy response of the Fed, including monetary policy, um, the broader uh, response in terms of changes in financial regulation, and a, a little bit of forward-looking discussion about how this experience will change how central banks operate and how the Federal Reserve will operate uh, going forward. So this is our topic today, is origins and missions of the Federal Reserve. So let's talk in general about what a central bank is. Um, if you've had some background in economics, you know that a central bank is not a regular bank, it's a government agency, and it stands at the center of the monetary and financial system of a country. Uh, central banks are, are very important institutions. They have helped to guide the development of modern financial systems, modern monetary systems, and they play a major role in economic policy. Now, uh, we've had various arrangements over the years, but today virtually all countries have central banks. The Federal Reserve in the United States, the Bank of Japan in Japan, Bank of Canada, and so on. The main exception is only cases where you have what's called a currency union, where a number of countries collectively share a central bank. Uh, the most important example by far of that is the European Central Bank, which is central bank to 17 uh, European countries who share the common currency, the euro. But even in that case, each of the uh, participating countries does have its own central bank, which is part of the overall system uh, of the euro. So central banks are now ubiquitous. Um, even the smallest countries uh, typically have central banks. Now, this is a very important theme here. What, what do central banks do? What is their mission? And as I'll discuss uh, throughout the lectures, um, it's convenient to talk about two broad aspects of what central banks do. The first is to try to achieve macroeconomic stability. And by that, I generally mean uh, stable growth in the economy, avoiding big swings, recessions, and, and the like, uh, and keeping inflation low and stable. So that's the economic function of a central bank. Uh, the other function of central banks, which is going to get a lot of attention, obviously, in uh, these lectures, is the financial stability function. Um, central banks try to keep the financial system working normally, and in particular, they either they try to prevent, or if unsuccessful in preventing, uh, they try to mitigate financial panics or financial crises. And I'll talk more about what, what those are. Now, what are the tools that uh, central banks use to achieve these two broad objectives? Um, very, in very uh, simple terms, there are basically two broad sets of tools. On the economic stability side, uh, the main tool, as I'm sure everyone knows, is monetary policy. Um, in normal times, uh, the Fed, for example, can raise or lower short-term interest rates. It does that by buying and selling securities in the open market. Um, in, again, in normal times, if the economy is growing too slowly or inflation is falling too low, um, the Fed can stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates. Lower interest rates feed through to a broad range of other interest rates. Uh, that encourages uh, spending, uh, acquisition of homes, for example, construction, uh, investment by firms, uh, borrowing. It just generates more demand, more spending, more investment uh, in the economy, and that creates more thrust and growth. Um, so that. To, to stimulate an economy, you lower interest rates. And similarly, if uh, the economy is growing too hot, if inflation is becoming a problem, uh, then the, the normal tool of central bank is, is to raise interest rates. Uh, so by raising the overnight interest rate, uh, known in the United States as the federal funds rate, uh, higher interest rates feed through the system and help to slow the economy by raising the cost of borrowing, of buying a house, of buying a car, or of investing in capital goods. And that will slow the economy and reduce uh, pressure of overheating. So monetary policy is the basic tool that central banks have used for many, many years to try to keep the economy on a more or less even keel in terms of both growth and inflation. Now, a little less familiar is the main tool of central banks in dealing with financial panics or financial crises. And 
that uh, tool is uh, the provision of liquidity. So uh, to address financial stability concerns, and for reasons I'll explain, one thing that central banks can do is make short-term loans to financial institutions. Um, as I'll explain, uh, providing short-term credit to financial institutions during a period of panic or, or crisis can help calm the market, can help stabilize those institutions, and can help mitigate or bring to an end a financial crisis. So uh, this activity, uh, which is an old one as I'll discuss, uh, is known as the lender of last resort tool. Um, so again, if uh, financial markets are disrupted, um, financial institutions don't have alternative uh, sources of funding, then the central bank stands ready to serve as the lender of last resort, providing liquidity to the system, and thereby helping to stabilize the financial system. Now there's a third tool uh, which the Fed has had from the beginning, and most central banks have, which is financial regulation and supervision. Um, central banks usually play a role in supervising the banking system, uh, assessing the extent of risk on their portfolios, making sure their practices are sound, and that way trying to keep the financial system healthy. Um, to the extent the financial system can be kept healthy and its risk taking within reasonable bounds, then the chance of a financial crisis occurring in the first place is reduced. However, uh, this activity, although I'll come back to it, um, this is something which is not unique to central banks. In the United States, for example, there are a number of different agencies, uh, like the FDIC or the Office of the Control of the Currency, that work with the Fed in supervising the financial system. So this is not unique to central banks, and so I'm, I'll be downplaying this for the time being and focusing on the two principal tools, monetary policy and lender of last resort activities. Now, where do central banks come from? Uh, one thing people don't appreciate, I think, is that central banking is not a new development. It's been around for a very long time. Um, the Swedes uh, set up a central bank in 1668, three and a half centuries ago. Uh, the Bank of England uh, was founded in 1694, and that, of course, uh, for many decades, or if not centuries, was the most important and influential central bank in the world, and uh, France in 1800. So, um, Central bank uh, theory and practice is, again, not a new, uh, a new thing. Um, we have been thinking about these issues collectively as an economics profession um, and in other contexts uh, for many, many years. Now, I've exaggerated slightly in the sense that, say, the Bank of England in 1694 wasn't set up uh, from scratch as a full-fledged central bank. It was originally a private institution, um, and over time it acquired some of the functions of a central bank, such as uh, issuing money uh, or serving as lender of last resort. Uh, but over time, uh, the, uh, these central banks became essentially government agencies, government institutions, as they all are today. Certainly one important responsibility of central banks for much of the period that I'm talking about was to manage the gold standard, to um, issue paper money that was backed by gold, and I'll talk more about gold in a few moments. Now, the lender of last resort function, which I mentioned earlier, uh, became uh, important in the, uh, uh, mostly in the 19th century. Uh, early in the 19th century, the Bank of England was doing a lot of this type of activity, and they became very good at it. And as we'll see, uh, while the United States was suffering with uh, banking panics, in the latter part of the 19th century, um, banking panics in the United Kingdom were, were quite, uh, quite rare. So the Bank of England sort of set the, set the pace in some sense. It was the most important central bank, and it helped establish the practices and the approaches that we still use today. <coughs> now I need to talk a little bit, because it's less familiar, about what a financial panic is. Um, in general, a financial panic is sparked by a loss of confidence in an institution. And I think the best way to explain this is to give uh, a familiar example. Um, how many of you have ever seen uh, the movie It's a Wonderful Life? No? Less people are watching Christmas movies than they used to be, I guess. Um, well, one of the problems that Jimmy Stewart runs into uh, as a banker in Wonderful Life is a threatened run on his institution. And what is a run? Well, um, 
let's imagine a situation uh, like Jimmy Stewart's situation before there was any deposit insurance, no FDIC. And imagine you have a bank on the corner, it's a regular commercial bank, First Bank of uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, this bank uh, makes loans to businesses and the like, and it uh, finances itself by taking deposits from the public. And deposits are demand deposits, which means that anybody can pull out their money anytime they want, which is important because people use deposits for ordinary uh, activities like shopping. Now, imagine what would happen if, uh, for some reason, a rumor goes around that uh, this bank has made some bad loans and is losing money. Now, as a depositor, you say to yourself, well, I don't know if this rumor is true or not. But what I know is, if that I wait, and everybody else pulls out their money, and I'm the last person in line, I may end up with nothing. So what's, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the bank and say, well, I'm not sure if this is a true rumor or not, but knowing that everybody else is going to come to the bank, I'm going to go pull my money out. And so um, depositors line up. They pull out their cash. No bank holds cash equal to all their deposits. They, they put that cash into loans. So the only way the bank can pay off the depositors once it gets through its minimal cash reserves is to sell or otherwise dispose of its, its loans. But it's very hard to sell a, a commercial loan. It takes time. You, get, you have to sell it at a discount. And by the time you've gotten around to doing that, uh, depositors are at your door and saying, where's my money? And so ultimately, a panic can lead the bank to close and be a self-fulfilling prophecy. The bank will fail. Uh, it'll have to sell off its assets at a discount price. And ultimately, many depositors might lose money, uh, as happened in the Great Depression, for example. So a bank panic uh, is, a, is a problem which is faced by any institution where um, it has uh, loans or other illiquid type uh, assets, and it finances itself by short-term uh, deposits or other short-term lending. Now, panics uh, can be a serious problem. Um, obviously, uh, if one bank is having problems, people at the bank next door might begin to worry about problems in their bank. And so uh, a bank run can lead to widespread bank runs or a banking panic more broadly. Sometimes banks, uh, in, uh, again, pre-FDIC, banks would respond to a panic or a run by refusing to pay out deposits. And they would just say, no more, we're closing the window. So that uh, restriction on the access of depositors to their money uh, was another bad outcome and caused problems for people who had to make a payroll or had to buy their groceries. Many banks would fail. And beyond that, uh, banking panics often spread into other markets. Uh, we're often associated with stock market crashes, for example. And all those things together, as you might expect, uh, were bad for the economy. And so a banking panic could lead uh, to a um, crash uh, in the economy as well. So here's a, a formal definition, just for your reference. On the left, you see people around, standing around the corner waiting to take out their money. But a financial panic is, can occur any time you have an institution that has longer-term illiquid assets. So think of a bank that has loans that are long-term loans that are illiquid in the sense that it takes time and effort to sell those loans and which are financed on the other side of the balance sheet by short-term liabilities like deposits, but could be other signs of short-term liabilities. Anytime you have that situation, you have the possibility that the people who put their money in the bank or the lenders or the depositors may say, wait a minute, I don't want to leave my money here. I'm pulling it out. And you have uh, a, a serious problem for the uh, institution. So now to come back to what we were talking about before, how, how, can, uh, how could the Fed have, have helped Jimmy Stewart? Well, uh, again, lender of last resort is the uh, basic tool. Uh, imagine that Jimmy Stewart is paying out uh, money to his depositors. Uh, he's got plenty of good loans, but he can't, ch he can't uh, change those into cash, and he's got people at the door looking for money. Well, if the Federal Reserve was on the job, uh, Jimmy Stewart could call up the local Fed office and say, look, I've got a whole bunch of good loans. I can offer them as collateral. Give me cash. Give me a cash loan against this collateral. Okay. Um, so the central bank would act in this way as a lender of last resort. The, um, uh, Jimmy Stewart can take the cash from the central bank, uh, 
he can pay off his depositors, and then so long as he really is solvent, as, the, as long as his loans are really are good, uh, the run will be uh, quelled, will be stopped, and the panic will come to an end. So by providing short-term loans, taking as collateral the illiquid assets of the institution, the central bank can put money into the system, pay off depositors, pay off short-term lenders, and calm the situation and end the panic. This was something that uh, Bank of England figured out very early. In fact, a very key uh, person in the in intellectual development here was a, a journalist um, named Walter Badgett, uh, who thought a lot about uh, banking, uh, central banking policy. And he had a dictum which said that during a panic, central banks should lend freely. Whoever comes to your door, as long as they have collateral, give them money. This is, this is during a banking panic. Against good assets, to make sure that you get your money back, you need to have collateral. And that collateral has to be good, or it has to be discounted. You may could lend half the value of the collateral, for example. And charge a penalty interest rate so that people don't just take advantage of the situation, but rather they signal that they really need the money because they're willing to pay a slightly higher interest rate. So again, uh, if you follow Badgett's rule, you can uh, stop financial panics. Um, as a bank or other institution finds that it's losing its funding from, um, from depositors or other short-term lenders, uh, it borrows from the central bank. The central bank provides cash loans against collateral. The, uh, the company then pays off its depositors, and again, uh, things calm down. Without that source of funds, without that lender of last resort activity, many institutions would have to close their doors. They would go bankrupt. If they had to sell their assets at discount fire sale prices, that would also create problems because other banks would find the value of their assets had gone down. And so the panic through fear or through rumor or through declining asset values could spread throughout the banking system. So it's very important to get in there aggressively as a central banker, provide that short-term liquidity, and avoid the collapse of, or at least the serious stress on the system. So again, using the uh, assets as collateral, uh, banks borrow from the central bank. So that's a little bit of general theory about central banks and what they do. Again, their two broad functions are macroeconomic stability and financial stability. And they have tools uh, on both sides of that equation. So let's talk a little bit about specifically the United States and the Federal Reserve. And what we'll find is that the Federal Reserve, which was founded, uh, the law was passed in 1913. It was founded eventually in 1914. We'll find that concerns on both sides of this uh, uh, equation um, motivated the decision of Congress and President Wilson to create the Federal Reserve. Let's talk first about financial stability in the United States. Now, uh, after the Civil War and, and into the early 1900s, uh, there was no Federal Reserve, there was no central bank. Um, so uh, any kind of financial stability functions that couldn't be done, say, by the Treasury had to be done privately. And there were some interesting uh, examples of private attempts to create um, lender of last resort functions. So for example, uh, a, a very interesting example is the New York Clearinghouse. The New York Clearinghouse was a private institution. It was basically a club of ordinary commercial banks in New York City. And it was called the Clearinghouse because initially um, it, was, it served as a place where banks could clear checks against each other. They came at the end of each day and they traded you know, my checks against you and your checks against me and it was just a way of reducing the cost of managing checking. But um, uh, as time evolved, clearinghouses began to function uh, a little bit like central banks. So for example, if one bank came under a lot of pressure, the other banks might come together in the clearinghouse and, and lend money to that bank so it could pay its depositors. And so in that respect, they served as a lender of last resort. Another possibility was sometimes the clearinghouses would all agree that we're just going to shut down the banking system for a week, uh, all banks, and then they would, uh, the, they would go look at the bank that was in trouble and evaluate its balance sheet and determine whether it was, in fact, a sound bank. If it was, it would reopen, and normally that would calm things down. So there was some private activity 
to try to, um, to stabilize um, uh, the banking system. However, in the end, these kinds of private arrangements were just not sufficient. They didn't have uh, sufficient resources. They didn't have um, the uh, credibility of an of a independent central bank. After all, people could always wonder whether the banks were acting uh, in other than the public interest, since they were all private uh, institutions. And so um, it was necessary for the United States to get a lender of last resort that could stop runs on illiquid but still solvent commercial banks. So this is not a hypothetical issue. Uh, financial panics in the United States were a very big problem. So here's the period basically from um, the uh, restoration of the gold standard after the Civil War in 1879 through the founding of the Federal Reserve. And the graph here shows the number of banks closing uh, during each of of the six major banking panics that occurred during that time in the United States. You can see in the very severe financial panic of 1893, more than 500 banks failed across the country. So that was a really big panic and had significant consequences for the financial system and for uh, the economy. Now, 1907 was also a pretty sharp uh, financial crisis. Um, the banks that failed were larger. Uh, and uh, it was after that crisis that uh, the Congress began to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we need to do something about this. Maybe we need a central bank, a government agency that can, um, that can address the problem of financial panics. Uh, so that process began. There was a, a very substantial amount of uh, research done. A um, 23-volume study was prepared for the Congress about the central banking practices. Um, and Congress moved deliberatively towards uh, creating a, uh, a central bank. Before the new central bank was established, though, there was another serious financial panic in 1914. Um, so, as you can see, this really was a, a very serious problem for the U.S. economy. So, financial stability concerns were a major reason why uh, Congress decided to try to create a central bank in uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century. But remember, the other major mission of central banks is economic stability, monetary and economic stability. Now, uh, the monetary history of the United States is pretty complicated. I um, won't try to go through it all. But in the period uh, after the Civil War, um, towards until World War I, um, and then really all the way into the 30s, uh, the United States was on a gold standard. And as you probably know, a gold standard is at least a partial alternative to a central bank. Now, what is a gold standard? Um, what a gold standard is, is a, is a monetary system in which uh, the value of the currency is uh, fixed in terms of gold. Um, so, for example, uh, by law, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, the price of gold was set at $20.67 an ounce. So there was a fixed relationship between the dollar and a certain weight of gold. Um, and that, in turn, helps set uh, the money supply and helps set the price level in the economy. Um, there were central banks that helped manage the gold standard, but uh, to a significant extent, uh, a true gold standard creates an automatic uh, monetary system. Basically, uh, money is tied to gold. Now, Unfortunately, gold standards are uh, far from perfect monetary systems. Um, one small problem, which is not on the slides, but I'll just mention, is that there's an awful big waste of resources. I mean, what you have to do to have a gold standard is you have to go to South Africa or someplace and dig up tons of gold and move it to New York and put it in the basement of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And that's a lot of effort and work, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, Milton Friedman used to emphasize that that was a very serious cost of a gold, a gold standard, that all this gold was being uh, uh, dug up and then put back into another hole. So there is some cost to having a gold standard. But there are some other more uh, serious financial and economic concerns that uh, practical experience showed were part of a gold standard. Um, one of them was the effect that of a gold standard on the money supply. 
Um, since the gold standard determines the money supply, uh, there's not much scope for the central bank to use monetary policy to, to, to um, stabilize the, uh, the economy. Uh, and in particular, uh, under a gold standard, typically the money supply goes up and interest rates go down in periods of strong economic activity. So that's the reverse of what a central bank would normally do today. So uh, again, because you had a gold standard which tied uh, the money supply to gold, there was no flexibility for the central bank to lower interest rates in recession or raise interest rates in inflation. Now, some people view that as a, as a benefit of the gold standard, taking away the discretion from central banks, and, and there's an argument for that. But it, it did have the implication that uh, there was more volatility year to year uh, in the economy under a gold standard than there has been uh, in uh, modern times. So, for example, movements in output, the uh, variability was much greater uh, under the gold standard. And even year to year movements in inflation, the volatility was much greater under the gold standard. There were other concerns also with the gold standard. Um, now, one of the things that a gold standard does is it creates a system of fixed exchange rates between the currencies of countries that are on the gold standard. So, for example, um, in 1900, the uh, value of a dollar was about $20 per ounce of gold. At the same time, uh, the British set their gold standard as saying roughly, roughly four pounds, four British pounds per ounce of gold. So $20 equals one ounce of gold, four pounds equals one ounce of gold, so $20 equals four pounds. So what that's saying is basically that a pound is five dollars. So essentially, if both countries are on the gold standard, the ratio of prices between the two um, exchange rates is, is fixed. There's no variability, as we see today, when the euro can go up and the euro can go down. Now, again, some people would argue that's beneficial, but there is at least one problem, which is that if there are shocks or changes in the money supply in one country, and perhaps even a bad set of policies, other countries that are tied to uh, the currency of that country will also experience some of the effects of that. So I'll give you a modern example. Um, today, as you probably know, uh, China uh, ties its currency uh, to the dollar. It's become more flexible lately, but for a long time there's been a close relationship between the Chinese currency and the U.S. dollar. Now what that means is that if the Fed lowers interest rates and stimulates the U.S. economy because, say, we're in a recession, that means also that essentially monetary policy becomes easier in China as well because interest rates have to be the same in different countries with essentially the same currency. And those low interest rates may not be appropriate for China. And as a result, China may experience inflation uh, because it's essentially tied to uh, U.S. monetary policy. So fixed exchange rates between countries tend to transmit uh, both good and bad policies between those countries and take away the independence that individual countries have to um, uh, manage their own monetary policy. Yet another issue with the gold standard has to do with uh, speculative attack. Now normally, um, a, a, a central bank uh, with a gold standard uh, only keeps a fraction of the gold necessary to back the entire money supply. Uh, indeed, the Bank of England was famous for keeping, as Keynes called it, a thin film of gold. The, the British uh, central bank only kept a small amount of gold, and they relied on their credibility uh, to stand by the gold standard under all circumstances to, so that nobody ever challenged them about that, that issue. But if, if for whatever reason, if uh, markets lose confidence in your willingness, in your uh, commitment to maintaining that gold standard relationship, you can get a speculative attack. And this is what happened in 1931 to the British. Uh, in 1931, um, for a lot of good reasons, uh, speculators um, uh, lost confidence that the, that the British pound would stay on gold. So just like a run on a bank, they all brought their pounds to the Bank of England and said, give me gold. And it didn't take very long before the Bank of England was out of gold, because they didn't have all the gold they needed to support the money supply. And then 
there was essentially an, uh, they essentially had to leave the gold standard. So there was a lot of financial volatility created by this attack on the gold standard. There's a story told that a, um, a British official, Treasury official, was taking a bath. Um, an aide came running in saying, we're off the gold standard, we're off the gold standard. And he said, I didn't know we could do that. <laughs> but they could, and they had to. They had no choice because there was a speculative attack uh, on the pound. Moreover, and related to this, uh, as we saw in the case of the United States, gold standard had plenty of financial panics associated with it. So uh, financial stability was not uh, always uh, assured by um, the gold standard. And finally, just one last word on the gold standard. Um, one of the strengths that people uh, cite for the gold standard is that it creates a stable value for the currency, it creates a stable inflation. And that's true over very long periods, but over shorter periods, maybe even up to five or 10 years, um, you can actually have uh, a lot of inflation, rising prices, or deflation, falling prices, um, in a gold standard. And the reason is that um, in a gold standard, the amount of money in the economy varies according to things like gold strikes. So for example, if in the United States, if gold is discovered in California, and the amount of gold in the economy goes up, that will cause an inflation. Whereas if the economy is growing faster and there's a shortage of gold, that will cause a deflation. So over shorter periods of time, you frequently had uh, both inflations and deflations. Over very long periods of time, decades, uh, prices were quite stable. Now this again was a very significant concern in the United States. Here's a famous figure who you can see was a very good public speaker, uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, three-time Democratic candidate for president. Um, in the lat latter part of the 19th century, uh, there was a shortage of gold relative to economic growth. And since there wasn't enough gold in some sense, the money supply was shrinking relative to the economy, uh, the US economy was experiencing a deflation. That is, prices were gradually falling over this period. Now, this caused some problems. Um, and the people who were most concerned about it were um, uh, farmers and other agriculture-related uh, occupations. And think about this for a moment. If you're a farmer in Kansas, and you have a mortgage with a bank, and that mortgage requires, say, a fixed payment of $20 each month, that, that amount of money you have to pay is fixed. But how do you pay that? You pay it by growing your crops and selling your crops in market. Now, if you have a deflation going on, that means that the prices of your corn or your cotton or your, your grain uh, is falling over time. But your payment to the bank stays the same. So a deflation created a grinding pressure on farmers as they saw the prices of their products going down and uh, as their debt payments remained unchanged. And so farmers were squeezed by this decline in their crop prices. And they recognized that um, uh, this deflation was not an accident. The deflation was being caused by the gold standard. And so William Jennings Bryan ran for president in his principal, um, his principal platform, principal plank in his platform, was the need to modify the gold standard. In particular, he wanted to add silver uh, to the <laughs> metallic system so that there would be more money in circulation and, and more inflation. But he spoke about this in the usual uh, very eloquent way of 19th century orators. He said, you shall not press down upon, upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And again, what he was trying to say is that the gold standard is killing uh, honest, hardworking farmers who are trying to make their payments to, uh, to the bank and find the price of their crops going down over time. So the gold standard also uh, created problems and uh, uh, again, was a motivation for the founding of the Federal Reserve. <coughs> In 1913, uh, finally, after all the study, uh, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, uh, which established the Federal Reserve, which opened in, in 1914. Uh, there's a picture here, which hangs in the Fed, of uh, President Woodrow Wilson signing the Federal Reserve Act in 1914. Um, 
President Wilson uh, uh, viewed this as his primary, most important domestic accomplishment uh, in his first in his term. So again, why did they want a central bank? The Federal Reserve Act called on the newly established Fed to do two things: first, to serve as a lender of last resort, and to try to mitigate the panics that um, banks were experiencing every few years, and secondly, to manage the gold standard. Uh, that is to take the sharp edges off the gold standard to avoid sharp swings in interest rates and other uh, macroeconomic variables. So that was the uh, objective of the Federal Reserve. Now interestingly, um, the Fed was not the first attempt by Congress to create a central bank. There had been two previous attempts, one of them suggested by Alexander Hamilton and the second uh, somewhat later in the 19th century. In both cases, Congress let the central bank die. And basically the problem was that there was a lot of uh, uh, disagreement between uh, what today we would call Main Street and Wall Street. Um, the folks on Main Street, uh, could include farmers for example, uh, feared that the central bank uh, would be uh, mainly an instrument of the moneyed interests in New York and Philadelphia and would not represent the entire country, would not be a national central bank. And both um, the first and the second uh, attempts at, the, at creating a central bank failed for that reason. So Woodrow Wilson had, I think, a, a better idea, and he tried a different approach. And what he did was, is he created not just a single central bank, say in Washington, but he created 12 Federal Reserve banks located in major cities across the country. And so the picture shows the 12 Federal Reserve districts that we still have today, and each one has a Federal Reserve Bank in it. And then a Board of Governors, which oversees the whole system, um, is in Washington, D.C. Notice, by the way, how many of the little black dots are to the right. Uh, in 1914, most of the economic activity in the United States was in the eastern part of the country. Um, now, of course, it's much more even, but the reserve banks are in the same locations as they were in 1914. Um, but anyway, the, the point here, the, the value of this, uh, of this uh, structure was, again, creating a, a central bank where everybody, all parts of the country, would have a voice and where information about all aspects of our national economy uh, would be heard in Washington. And that is, in fact, still the case. Um, when the Fed makes monetary policy, it, it takes into account uh, the views of the uh, Federal Reserve Banks around the country, um, and therefore we have a national approach to making policy. So, the Fed was established in 1914, and for a while life was not too bad. Um, the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s, uh, this is called the Charleston, I think. Um, Life magazine, you never heard of that. But it was a very famous magazine for a long time. Anyway, um, the 1920s, the so-called Roaring Twenties, was a period of great prosperity in the United States. Uh, the U.S. was absolutely dominant economy in the world at that time because most of Europe was still in ruins from World War I. Um, there were lots of new inventions. Uh, people gathered around the radio and automobiles became uh, much more uh, available. And so there was a lot of new consumer durables and, and just a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, economic uh, growth uh, during the 20s. So that was, a, again, a period of prosperity, uh, particularly in the United States. And the Fed had some time to sort of get its feet wet and, and establish its, its procedures. Unfortunately, in 1929, uh, the world was hit by the first great challenge to the Federal Reserve and to uh, also all U.S. economic policymakers, which was the Great Depression. Um, as I'm sure you know, the U.S. stock market crashed in October 29th. And what you may not know is that the uh, financial crisis of the Great Depression was not just a U.S. phenomenon, it was global. Large financial institutions collapsed in Europe and other parts of the world. Perhaps the most damaging um, uh, financial collapse was of the of a large Austrian bank called the Credit Anstalt that collapsed in 1931 and brought down with it many other banks in, in Europe. 
So it was a global, a global phenomenon. Um, and as you know, of course, uh, the economy contracted very sharply, and the Depression lasted for an incredibly, seems like an incredibly long time, from 1929, and it only ended when the United States entered um, the war uh, after Pearl Harbor in 1941. So here are a few facts about the Depression. I, I think it's important to understand how deep and severe this episode was. Um, here's the stock market. And you can see the straight line at the left, the vertical line showing October 1929, a very sharp decline in stock prices, uh, unsurprisingly. This was the crash that was made famous by um, many writers, uh, including John Kenneth Galbraith and others who told colorful stories about uh, brokers jumping out of windows and all those things. Um, but what I want you to take from this picture is that the crash of 29 was only the first step in what was a much more serious uh, decline. Um, you see how the stock prices kept falling. And by mid-1932, uh, stock prices had fallen an incredible 85% uh, from their peak. So this was much worse than just uh, a couple of bad days in the stock market. The, 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 the real economy, the non-financial economy, also uh, suffered very greatly. Uh, the left-hand picture shows growth in real GDP. And so if, it's a, if the bar is above going pointing up, it's a growth period. If it's pointing down, it's a contraction period. So in 1929, the economy grew by more than 5%. It was still growing very substantially. But you can see that uh, from 1930 to 1933, the economy contracted by very large amounts every year. So there was an enormous contraction uh, of GDP uh, close to a third uh, overall uh, between 1929 and 1933. At the same time, the economy was experiencing deflation. Deflation is falling prices. And as you can see from the uh, right picture, um, in 1931 and 1932, prices fell by about 10%. So if you were a farmer who had trouble in the, in the late 19th century, imagine what's happening to you in, in 1932 when crop prices are dropping by half or more and you still have the same payment to the bank for your mortgage. Um, as the economy contracted, uh, unemployment soared. Um, we did not have the same survey of individual households in the 1930s that we have today, and so these numbers are estimated. They're not precise numbers. But as best we can tell, at its peak, uh, unemployment came close to 25% uh, in uh, the early 1930s. And you can see the, the light blue line is the uh, recession period. Even at the end of the 30s, um, before the war changed everything, unemployment was still around 13%. So unemployment rose tremendously. Bank failures. Uh, as you might guess, um, with all that was going wrong in the economy, a lot of depositors ran on their banks. The picture on the right, the graph on the right, shows the number of bank failures in each year. And you can see an enormous spike in the early 30s in number of failures. What caused this colossal calamity, which again I would reiterate was not just a US problem, but a global problem. One country, in fact, that had a worse depression than the United States was Germany. And uh, that led probably more or less directly to the election of Hitler in 1933. So why, were, why was there, what happened? What caused the Great Depression? This is a, a, a tremendously important subject and has received a lot of attention, as you might imagine, from economic historians. And as often is the case for very large events, there were many different causes. I mentioned a few here. Um, the repercussions of World War I. Um, problems with the international gold standard, which was being reconstructed, but with a lot of problems after World War I. Uh, the famous bubble in stock prices in the late 1920s. And the financial panic that uh, spread through the world. So there are a number of factors that uh, created the depression. But the one that I want to focus on here, uh, let me say one more word before turning on. Uh, Part of the problem was um, intellectual rather than uh, policy per se. At the time of the 1930s, there was a lot of support uh, for a 
approach or thinking about the economy called the liquidationist theory. And the idea behind it was the 1920s was too good a time. The economy expanded too fast. There, were, there was too much growth. There was too much credit extended. Uh, stock prices went too high. So what you need when you have a period of excess is a period of, of deflation, a period where all the excesses are squeezed out. So there was a point of view which said that the depression is unfortunate, but it's kind of necessary. We've got to squeeze out all of the excesses that accumulated in the economy in the 1920s. And there's a famous statement by Andrew Mellon, uh, who was Hoover's Secretary of the Treasury, uh, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate. Sounds pretty heartless, and I think it was, but what he was trying to convey here was that we've got to get rid of all the excesses of the 20s and bring the country back to a more fundamental sound uh, economy. All right, so what I wanted to get into here in the last few minutes is what, what was the Fed doing during this period? Unfortunately, the Fed met its first great challenge in the Great Depression and it failed, uh, both on the monetary policy side and on the financial stability side. On the monetary policy side, uh, Basic uh, bottom line here is that the Fed did not uh, ease monetary policy uh, the, way, um, the way you would expect it to in a period of deep recession for a variety of reasons, because it wanted to stop the stock market speculation, because it wanted to uh, maintain the gold standard, uh, because it believed in the liquidationist theory. For a variety of reasons, the Fed did not ease monetary policy, or at least not very much. And so we didn't get the offset to, um, uh, to the decline that monetary policy could have provided. And indeed, what we saw was um, the sharply falling prices. I mean, I think you can argue about causes of the decline in output and employment, but when you see 10% declines in the price level, you know monetary policy is much too tight. Uh, so the deflation was, in fact, an important part of the problem uh, because, again, it, it bankrupted uh, farmers and others who relied on uh, the sale of products to pay fixed debts. Uh, to make things even worse, as I mentioned before, if you have a gold standard, then you have fixed exchange rates. So the Fed's policies were essentially transmitted to other countries, which also essentially therefore came under excessively tight monetary policy, and that also contributed to the collapse. Now, again, as I mentioned, one reason why the Fed kept money tight was because it was worried about a speculative attack on the dollar. Remember, in 1931, the British had faced that situation. The Fed was worried that there would be a, a similar attack that would drive the dollar off gold. So to preserve the gold standard, they raised interest rates rather than lowered them. They argued by keeping interest rates high, uh, that would make uh, US investments attractive and prevent uh, uh, money from flowing out of, of, of the United States. But again, that was the wrong thing to do uh, relative to what the economy needed. In 1933, uh, Franklin Roosevelt abandoned the gold standard, and suddenly monetary policy became much less tight, and there was a very powerful rebound uh, in the economy in 1933-34. The other part of the Fed's responsibilities, of course, is uh, to be lender of last resort. And once again, the Fed did not meet its mandate. They responded inadequately to the bank runs, um, allowing essentially this tremendous decline in, um, in the banking system as many banks failed. Um, and as a result, um, bank failure swept the country. As I mentioned before, a very large fraction of the nation's banks failed. Almost 10,000 banks failed in, in the 30s. Um, and that continued until deposit insurance was created in 1934. Now, why did the Fed not more aggressively be lender of last resort? Why didn't it lend to these failing banks? Well, in some cases, the banks were really insolvent. There wasn't much could be done. Um, they had made loans in agricultural areas, and their loans were all going bad because of the crisis in the agricultural sector. But part of it was uh, the Fed appeared, at least to some extent, to agree with the, the liquidationist theory, which said that there's too much credit, you know, that we're overbanked, let the system contract, that's really the healthy thing, uh, but that was unfortunately uh, not uh, the right prescription. 
Now, of course, in uh, 33, uh, Franklin Roosevelt came uh, into power. Um, Roosevelt had a mandate to do something about the Depression. He took a variety of different actions. He was very experimental. Some of those actions uh, were quite unsuccessful. For example, uh, something called the National Recovery Act required, uh, tried to fight deflation by requiring firms to keep their prices high. But that, that wasn't going to help without a bigger money supply. Um, so a lot of things that Roosevelt did didn't work so well. But he did two things which, I would argue, did a lot to offset the mistakes, the problems that the Fed created. The first was, in 1934, the establishment of deposit insurance in the FDIC. Now, if you were an um, ordinary depositor in a bank and the bank failed, you still got your money back. And therefore, there was no, there was no incentive to run on the banks. And in fact, once it, the deposit insurance was established, they were essentially, we went from literally thousands of bank failures to zero. It was an incredibly effective policy. The other thing that FDR did, uh, although it, he threw up a lot of smoke while he was doing it, but basically he abandoned the gold standard. And by abandoning the gold standard, he allowed uh, uh, monetary policy to re be released and uh, allowed expansion of the money supply, which ended the deflation and led to a powerful short-term rebound uh, in 33 and 34. So the two most successful things that Roosevelt did were um, essentially uh, offsetting the problems uh, that the Fed uh, created, or at least uh, exacerbated, by not uh, fulfilling its responsibilities. So what are the policy lessons? It was a global depression, had many causes, the whole story requires you to look at the whole international system. Uh, but policy errors in the United States, uh, as well as abroad, did play an important role. And in particular, as I said, the Federal Reserve failed in this first challenge in both parts of its mission. It did not use monetary policy aggressively to prevent deflation and the collapse in the economy. So it failed in its economic stability function. And it didn't adequately perform its function as lender of last resort, allowing many bank failures and a resulting contraction in credit and also in the money supply. So uh, in that respect, um, uh, again, the, the Fed did not uh, fulfill its intended mission. So these are key lessons. Uh, we we'll want to keep these in mind as we consider how the Fed responded to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which we'll be getting to the beginning of next time and then in great detail next week. So next time on Thursday we'll review developments in central banking after World War II, but we'll spend plenty of time next time in the lead up to the crisis of 2008-2009 and we'll begin to see how the history of central banking explains how the Federal Reserve responded um, to this most recent and severe crisis. Okay. Um, I'd be happy now to take questions on, on the lecture. Yeah, Michael. You mentioned the, uh, the tightening of monetary policy in 1928 and 1929 to stem the stock market speculation. Do you think that uh, the Federal Reserve should have taken different actions to stem the speculation, like increasing margin requirements, or was it wrong for them to take any action at all against the bubble? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, but the Fed, what the Fed did, well, I think the mistake they made, they were very concerned about the stock market and they believed that it was excessively priced and there was evidence for that. Um, but what they did was they uh, attacked it solely by raising interest rates without attention to the effect on the economy. So by raising interest rates, they, they wanted to bring down the stock market and they succeeded, <laughs> of course. Uh, but the side effect of it was it also had major impacts on the economy as well. So I think, yeah, I think that uh, what we've learned about uh, asset price bubbles, they are dangerous, um, and we want to address them if possible. But where you can address them through um, uh, financial regulatory approaches, that's usually a more pinpoint approach than just raising interest rates for everything. So margin requirements, or, or at least looking at the variety of practices, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, very um, risky practices uh, by uh, brokers, you know, it, it was the equivalent of day traders. You know, every paper boy had a tip for you, and uh, there weren't very many checks and balances on, on trading and on who could make a trade and, and what the margin requirements were, et cetera. So um, 
It's a good question. Um, I think that uh, the first line of attack should have been more focused on bank lending, on financial regulation, and on the functioning of the exchanges. I have a, a question on the gold standard. Um, given everything that we know about monetary policy now and about the modern economy, why is there still an argument, some argument, for returning to the gold standard, and is it even possible? So uh, the argument, um, I think, has two, two parts. Um, one is the desire to maintain, uh, quote, the value of the dollar. I mean, basically, it's, a, it's a, a desire to have very long run price stability. Um, so the, the argument is that paper money is inherently inflationary, so if you have a gold standard, you'll, you won't have inflation. Um, and as I said, that's, that's true to some extent over long periods of time. Uh, but from a year-to-year -year basis, it, it's not true. And uh, so looking at history is helpful there. Um, the other reason uh, I think that gold standard advocates uh, want to see return to gold uh, is that it re removes discretion. It doesn't allow the central bank to respond uh, with monetary policy, for example, to, um, to booms and busts. And the advocates of the gold standard say it's better not to give that flexibility to the central bank. So those are basically the arguments. Um, I think, though, that, um, that the gold standard would not be feasible for both, um, for both uh, practical reasons and policy reasons. On the practical side, uh, there's just a simple fact that there's not enough gold to, to meet the, the needs of a global gold standard. Uh, and achieving that much gold would be very expensive, um, cost a lot of resources. But more fundamentally than that is that the world has changed. So, so the reason, the, reason um, the Bank of England could maintain uh, the gold standard, even though it had a very small number amount of gold reserves, was that everybody knew that they were going to, their first, first, second, third, and fourth priority was staying on gold, and that they had no interest in any other policy objective. But uh, once there was concern that Bank of England might, you know, might not be fully committed, then there was a speculative attack that drove them off gold. Now, economic historians argue that after World War I, uh, after World War I, the labor movements became much stronger, and uh, there was a lot more concern about unemployment. Before the 19th century, people didn't even measure unemployment. And after the World War I, you began to get much more attention to unemployment and business cycles. So in a modern world, uh, the commitment to the gold standard would mean that we are swearing that under no circumstances, no matter how bad unemployment gets, are we going to do anything about it using monetary policy. And if, if investors had 1% doubt that we would follow that promise, then they would have every incentive to bring their cash and take out gold, and, this, and, and in fact, it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We've seen that problem with various kinds of uh, fixed exchange rates that have come under attack during financial crises. So I, I understand the impulse, but I think if you look at actual history, you'll see that uh, the, the gold standard didn't work that well, and, and it worked particularly poorly after World War I. Indeed, well, I won't go into it, um, there's a, a good bit of evidence that um, the gold standard was one of the main reasons that the Depression was so deep and long. And a striking fact is that countries that left the gold standard early and gave themselves flexibility on monetary policy recovered much more quickly than the countries that stayed on gold to the bitter end. You mentioned that uh, President Roosevelt used uh, deposit insurance to help end the runs and also uh, abandoning the gold, uh, the gold standard to, uh, to help end deflation. And um, I believe that in 1936 to 1937 up until 1941 we, we had a double dip and uh, the recession sort of uh, went on, and uh, as you've seen today that we were sort of out of the recession, uh, what do you think uh, are things that we need to be careful of that possibly they, they had mistakenly done in the Great Depression that we, in parallel, should be doing today? Right. <clears throat> it isn't uh, generally appreciated. The Great Depression actually was two recessions. There was a very sharp recession in 2933, uh, from, from 33 to 37, there was actually a decent amount of growth. Stock market recovered some. Um, but in 37, 38, there was a second 
recession that wasn't quite as serious as the first one, but still serious. Um, and there's a lot of, I, I don't want to you know, take a while to go through all the discussion there, but there's a lot of controversy about it. But, but one view that was um, uh, advanced early on was that the second recession came from a premature tightening of monetary and fiscal policy. So uh, in 37-38, there was um, uh, Roosevelt under a lot of pressure uh, to uh, reduce budget deficits and so on, tightened fiscal policy quite a bit. The Fed, uh, worried about inflation, tightened monetary policy. Um, now again, as I, I don't want to claim it's all that simple. A lot was happening. But uh, the early interpretations, at least, were that the reversal in policy too soon uh, prevented the recovery from proceeding faster. Um, I think uh, we'll talk about lessons uh, later on, but I think if you accept that traditional interpretation, it is that you need to be attentive to where the economy is and not move too quickly to uh, reverse the policies that are helping the recovery. Based on um, a few of the graphs that we saw today and other historical trends, it seems that after an economic slump, slump Recovery often takes five or more years, uh, as represented by the Great Depression and the oil crises in the 70s. I was wondering, do you think it is common for unemployment to remain at high levels until sometimes a half decade after an economic slump, and that criticisms are often premature? And moreover, um, how do you address these concerns in a political environment when short-term fixes are often, they often rule the day? Well, let me just comment that um, the Depression was a, a sort of extraordinary event. I mean, um, there were many serious uh, declines in economic activity in the 19th century, but nothing quite as deep or quite as long as the Great Depression. Um, so the high unemployment that lasted from 1929 until basically World War II, that was unusual. Um, uh, so we wouldn't conclude that that was a normal state of affairs. Now, more generally, there is some research um, that suggests that following a financial crisis, it may take longer for the economy to recover because you need to restore the health of the financial system. And that may be one reason, so argued, that the recovery, uh, this most recent recovery, is not proceeding faster than it is. Um, but that's, I think, it's still an open question. And there, there's a lot of discussion about that research as well as discussion of you know, what might underlie that sort of stylized fact that, that is out there. So no, it's not always the case. I mean, if you look at um, uh, recessions in the post-war period in the United States, you see very frequently that recoveries only take a couple of years. Um, but very, uh, in fact, very sharp uh, recoveries, typical re recessions are typically followed by a faster recovery. That's been the pattern in the post-war period. What may be different about this episode, and again, once more, this is a subject of, of debate, is that unlike the other recessions in the post-war period, this one was related to and triggered by a global financial crisis. And so it may be that it's going to take longer, it's already taking longer for the economy to recover. But um, again, uh, a lot of issues still to, uh, to be resolved. Last question. Anyone else? Melanie. Since so you said the depression was global, recessions are global. Is, shouldn't there, you feel like, be more global like cooperation and the central banks to have a, like, a uniform mm -hmm. type of fix they kind of coordinate on instead of every country determining their own like, fixes? Well, you set me up perfectly for my <laughs> lecture next week. <laughs> and I'll talk, about, I'll talk about how the Fed and other central banks did cooperate and continue to cooperate. Um, one of the problems in um, in the Depression was, an, uh, was the bad um, feelings left over from World War I. You know, in, the, in the 19th century, there was a reasonable amount of cooperation amongst, among central banks. But in the 1920s, Germany was facing having to pay reparations. France and England and the U.S. were all bickering about uh, war debts. Um, and so uh, the politics was quite bad internationally. And uh, that impeded some of the cooperation of central banks. The other thing to say is that um, international central bank cooperation is probably even more important when you have fixed exchange rates. 
Um, so you had fixed exchange rates in the 20s because of the gold standard. That meant that monetary policy in one country affected everybody. So that was certainly a case for more coordination. Didn't get it. Uh, at least today, uh, we have flexible exchange rates, which can adjust and tend to insulate uh, other countries from the effects of monetary policy in a given country. And so that reduces somewhat the need for coordination, but there's still, I think, a need for coordination. Well, thanks. This has been great, and uh, I'll be back in, on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.